welcome to First. I'm Nichelle Polston. Karen Smiles joins me this week. Mark Eichmann will be along later in the broadcast. The emotional funeral for Beau Biden has brought into focus his battle with brain cancer. A look this week at the disease that does not discriminate. We look inside to a Delaware prison program aimed at teaching inmates a skill, creating some interesting food products. And the horse painter who shows us how to really bring an animal to life. First, your public media news magazine starts now. Over a thousand people turned out at St. Anthony of Padua Church to honor Bo Biden. That number does not include the tens of thousands who turned out at several viewings in the days leading up to the funeral mass. Bo Biden died of brain cancer. One type of brain cancer is glioblastoma, or GBM. The cancer doesn't discriminate. Laura Smith of Greenville knows that. Her husband died of the disease. Here's First Look. Laura Smith knows all too well about the obstacles facing someone who has been diagnosed with a malignant brain tumor. In 2008, her husband Don was diagnosed with one. Smith says Don, who worked in Delaware's banking industry, was a healthy man. Then out of the blue, the symptoms started. He was suddenly having some problems with, with words. He was, could not re remember words. He could remember the phone numbers of all these people at work, but he could not remember their names. Troubled by his loss for words, Don made an appointment to see a doctor. His primary care physician thought he was tired and stressed, so he ordered some blood tests. But the symptoms progressed, so the couple sought out the help of a neurologist. We were able to get a, an MRI and then it came back that he had a brain tumor the size of a tangerine. Dr. Falchek, medical oncologist at the Helen Graham Cancer Center and Research Institute at Christina Care, says there are some warning signs of a tumor. The brain is encased by the skull, so there's not a lot of room, a lot of give. So when you have uh, something growing in the brain and causing swelling, you tend to get headaches. Uh, other symptoms would, could include nausea and vomiting. You can get seizures, memory loss, cognitive dysfunction, uh, personality changes. The Smiths soon found themselves gathering as much information about brain tumors as they could so they could fight back. The first line of action, get the tumor out. He had a very good surgical outcome. He, they got about 98% of the tumor, which is really good. Dr. Falchek says surgical removal can be challenging and usually requires a combination of treatments. A lot of these tumors have like tentacles, roots underneath the surface. So even when uh, you've removed, you think you remove all the tumor grossly, uh, there's tumor that's still remaining uh, underneath uh, the superficial tumor that uh, is difficult to remove, so eventually it grows back. Despite the successful removal of the tumor, Laura says their hopes were soon dashed when the symptoms returned. In 2009, one day before his 52nd birthday, Don passed away. This is a horrible disease. It's so insulting. It's so... Um, so cruel because it attacks your brain, it attacks who you are, and you see your loved one just disappear in front of you. Laura turned her pain into purpose. She's working to raise awareness and funds for brain tumor research. Laura is involved with several organizations, which include the Kelly Hines Grunner Brain Tumor Foundation, the Delaware Brain Tumor Walk, and the National Brain Tumor Society. Her involvement gave her additional hope. This is such an important cause for so many people and how this money will go to find new treatments, uh, better treatments, and hopefully a cure. Don's memory will be with Laura and her family as their daughter gets married this summer. If you want to know more about Laura and Don's story and a way to contribute to cancer research, go to our website, newsworks.org slash Delaware. Michelle, flags are still flying at half staff to honor Bo Biden. It was amazing to see the numbers of people who came out to honor the former attorney general. Our show deadline didn't allow us to show the events from Thursday through Saturday. We offer this time capsule.
The Biden family is Delaware's family. And Bo's dedication to and love for you and your dedication and love right back is what we all want for our own families. And Bo is a model for what a public servant should be. The Proverbs teach us to say, not in grief he is no more, but in thankfulness that he was. We know how much family meant to Bo Biden, not just his personal family, but to all the families of Delaware. Throughout his whole career of his life, he just went to help people. Not only a loss for him and his family, but even for Delaware, because we were hoping maybe Bo could be governor. He was um, a very good person, as well as a community activist. He cared about all people. Bo was a, a, a unique politician who really was, when he met people, you had a very good feeling about him. He came across as somebody who was very genuine and wanted to help. To know Bo Biden is to know which choice he made in his life. He did in 46 years what most of us couldn't do in 146. He left nothing in the tank. What a good man. What an original. May God bless his memory and the lives of all he touched. could adequately describe my love, admiration, and adoration for my brother. Nothing I say will give justice to what he means to me, to us. And when trying to recall certain memories, I am at a loss because my life is a collage of memories and moments. Bo was a constant presence every day of my life. It's impossible to talk about Bo without talking about Hunter. They were inseparable and shared a love that is unconditional. Although Bo was one year and one day older, Hunter was the wind beneath Bo's wings. I used to have to follow my brother. Now I have to follow my sister. Makes it very hard. On behalf of our family, I want to recognize and thank all the religious leaders here to celebrate my brother's life. It means such a great deal to us, and you know it would mean a great deal to him. Thank you. General, thank you for being here today. Bo was so proud of his service to this nation, and he was especially proud to serve under your leadership. Mr. President, you know how much he loved you. Thank you for all that you've done for our family, Michelle, particularly these difficult days. That was an incredible tribute. Thank you. To me, my brother is not defined by his extraordinary resume. He's defined by the quality of his character. The boy, the man who always held you close, the one who always made you feel safe.
If you want to see our tribute program from last week, please go to whyy.org slash first. In a couple of minutes, we'll wrap up our coverage with the cartoon from Rob Torno. Next, the State of Play team sits down with Michelle. We're going to split our State of Play conversation in two this week. Let's bring in Stephanie Hansen from the law firm of Young Conaway, Stargett and Taylor. Also, Michael Stafford, attorney, columnist, and MSNBC contributor. It was amazing to see the large crowds that turned out uh, this past week to honor Bo Biden. What do you think? Oh, absolutely. I was, I was part of the crowd. <laughs> uh, you know, they really are uh, Delaware's uh, royal family, you know. And I think a beyond that, I think a lot of people really felt, felt for um, the vice president and yeah. for his family because Bo was a very beloved person and managed to touch a lot of people's lives in the time that he'd been in office and even before then. This is a man who has now buried two of his children, and no parent, I don't care where you are politically and how much you disagree with him, no parent should ever have to go through that. And I think everybody in the state can empathize with him and with what he's been through. What do you think uh, the political, let's talk about the political dominoes that, that will play out after the death of, because of the death of Bo Biden. Uh, what, are you guys, what are you guys thinking here? Well, there's going to be a whole, I mean, all the dominoes are falling. And it, obviously in the Democratic gubernatorial race, it's looking like we're going to have Tom Gordon versus John Carney. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think that's a shoe over or a walk over for, uh, for, for John Carney. Um, Tom Gordon seems to be, he's in the paper every day, as, as Stephanie was saying before we, we, we started taping the show. And he, he's, he's out there and he's got a lot of, of a he's time. built a lot of political capital, let's yeah. put it that way with other office holders. So I think he's going to be a tough candidate. And I think, I think for a, a period of time, things are going to be a little quiet, not, not for too much longer, right. but I think out of respect for the Biden family, you know, um, there won't be any announcements maybe within the next week or two. But once we get beyond, beyond that, um, I think you'll start to see um, some announcements being made. Do you think it, was a e it would have been an easy win for Bo had he been alive? Depen I think so. De depending on his health, whether that issue had been clarified, if he, if he, if he hadn't passed away, and if it looked like his health was going to be okay, I think it would have been a shoe in. Mm -hmm. um, I agree. If his health had still been in question, I think the race would have been in question. Mm -hmm. But uh, from a from a Republican perspective, I think they've got to be salivating at the thought of this knockdown, drag out brawl between Tom Gordon and and John Carney. Um, it's almost their their a, a dream come true for them. Because whoever comes out of that is going to come out wounded. It's probably best to wait at least a month. Mm -hmm. um, but beyond that, you know, I think that we'll start to see some announcements. And even right now, kind of behind the scenes, there are a lot. There's there's a lot going on behind the scenes right now. Yes. Just because you're not hearing any announcements doesn't mean that there isn't a whole lot going on. Because there is. And once you hear the first announcement, then the others are going to fall in place very quickly. Okay. Let's uh, take a pause, and we'll pause this conversation for a moment. We'll. We can actually get back to some other issues later in the program. We're going to wrap up our coverage now with a look at the cartoon that we publish on Newsworks.org. Delaware prisoners processed almost 4,000 pounds of deer meat into jerky during the last hunting season. The jerky processing program is designed to teach inmates a skill. Mark Eichmann got to go into the Sussex County prison where the work is done. We should also enable more offenders to develop their job skills and abilities while incarcerated. As a young woman on the east side of Wilmington recently told me, the streets are always hiring. We can't let the street be the only option. Helping prisoners develop job skills is exactly the goal of the Sussex County Community Correction Center in Georgetown. That's the desire across the department. Our job is to house people who are sentenced to level five and four, uh, but we don't want to see them again. No, you know, no offense to those individuals, but we would like them all to go on and become successful, law-abiding, productive citizens. They chop wood that will be sold for use by visitors to Delaware State Parks. They process cans and cardboard from other state facilities for recycling. 
There's even an automotive maintenance building where old state police cruisers are decommissioned and other fleet vehicles are maintained. Prisoners sentenced to level four incarceration work and learn a trade, ideally developing marketable skills that they'll be able to use on the outside. Department's interested in public safety as well as rehabilitation, and they really take that to heart here, the rehabilitation uh, component it comes to life here. It all happens under the watchful eye of Warden Bill Edel. There's no bad idea, you know, we'll, we'll certainly toss it around and, and see where it goes and, uh, you know, and that's where we've gotten, you know, I, you know I, as you can see, we're involved in a lot of things. One of the things they're involved in is a butcher shop run by inmates. Yes, inmates given sharp knives to butcher deer that have been donated by local hunters. The meat is then ground into two-pound sections and donated to local food banks. There's even jailhouse jerky. That was an idea that was brought to me uh, quite a few years ago. And said, well, what's your thoughts about opening a butcher shop and processing deer and things like that? I said, well, you know, well, let's, let's look at it a little bit more. So ran it by the uh, administration and uh, commissioner and everything, and we started. So that's what normally takes course here. Up next, this building is being transformed into an auto body and welding fabrication shop. And yes, those are prisoners working on the construction of the new body shop themselves. Everything has to be self-supporting. No tax dollars going back into this. All these projects and programs that we're involved with are, are self-supporting and along with uh, teach the offenders a background and skill set. One skill set Governor Markell wants to expand training for is in the kitchen. He talked about it in January's State of the State. I propose that we also expand the culinary arts program at James P. Vaughn. In doing so, I am reminded of the late restaurateur and philanthropist Matt Hale. He credited his culinary training in prison with turning his life around. It is appropriate that we name this initiative the Matt Haley Culinary Arts Program as a reminder that everyone has something to contribute when given the chance. Haley, who died in an accident in India last fall, helped launch the culinary program for inmates in Georgetown, donating hundreds of dollars worth of kitchen supplies through his company, Sodell Concepts. He really um, assisted in that and, and made it easier on us to, to get it done and, and get it done quickly. They donated our small wares with the stainless steel items and the Schaefer pots and um, a lot of the utensils and our knives that we have for this program were donated all through Matt Haley's company, uh, Sodell Concepts. Inmates who go through the culinary program here get a foot in the door with an employer. Once they go into the community for the last two weeks, that is a paid internship. And generally speaking, um, it, it, there's a pretty good success rate that once they go into a restaurant setting and they have an opportunity to see what they can do, that they will go ahead and hire them. Once the plans for a new training kitchen at Vaughn Correctional Center in Smyrna are complete, the aim is to connect the two programs. That would be a beginning program at the level five facilities and then they would transition into the level four and go through this 14 week program which gives them uh, 12 weeks of in-class instruction and then two weeks in an internship. Seeing inmates learn a skill that can keep them from returning to prison is a fitting tribute for Haley's life. You walk away thinking and feeling like you're helping. Uh, I think that's a big part of this. It's not just individuals being housed here. They're, they're hopefully getting something out of this, and that's what we're looking for. Mark reports that Warden Hotel continues to look for ways to expand the skill development efforts at the Department of Corrections. And as for those inmates who work with sharp knives, they are supervised. But the key is that they want to do this. So there is a motivation factor. It's our bonus state of play. Stephanie Hansen and Michael Stafford are back to talk about other things like the legislative agenda in Dover. The News Journal put out a laundry list of possible items. There's decriminalizing marijuana and the budget and even casinos. But the one that caught my eye is body cameras. Uh, there's a study right now on it and uh, hopefully this will actually push through. Uh, but what are you guys, what are you guys thinking? Well, I mean, it, for for when we talk about police body cameras, I mean, obviously, uh, police departments around the country have been in the news recently. Um, I think that uh, Williams's proposal is is a good one. I, I think, you know, in law enforcement, the camera is your friend if you're doing things right. The camera is only, only your enemy um, if you're doing something wrong. And so 
while it's not a cure-all, I think it could address uh, many of these kind of situations, including I mean, the recent video from Texas where you know, there's, there's major discrepancies in the stories between different witnesses. You've got these short segments of cell phone footage from a much broader event, and uh, having body cameras on those officers gives you the opportunity, if they're working, mm -hmm. to see what they're seeing and to, to view an event in its totality. I think they'll find a way to, to afford it, and it, I think it would help give um, some confidence in the police department and the work that they're doing. Well, let's switch gears. GFC goes in high gear on June 22nd. Uh, what about these defect numbers? <laughs> yeah, I mean, we've talked about the budget a couple of times, and, and, and again, the numbers, the numbers don't look as bad as they originally did, but we, we, we're still facing a budget shortfall. And then when you listen to some of the revenue-generating proposals that are being floated, again, you know, one of my big concerns, of, so for example, when I hear, you know, Ken Simpler talking about reducing or eliminating the estate tax, mm -hmm. um, you know, my, my temperature goes up because <laughs> the last thing I think the richest Delawareans need right now is additional tax cuts. I, I don't see how that's going to generate, generate additional revenue. I know that the, in the mix is still the discussion of the gas tax, which may actually come to fruition in, in some amount. Um, there's still, at least on the table, there's the discussion of the, an additional cigarette tax. We'll see what happens with that. Um, so, you know, those, these big budget issues are only going to get worse next year. So everyone is going to be concentrating very hard on them this year. I think that decriminalization of marijuana will probably pass. Um, I think the death penalty is probably dead, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. I, I, well, no I pun intended. Say, right? no <laughs> pun intended. <laughs> there was a bill, though, that just recently passed that I think could be of interest to a lot of people, will be of interest to a lot of people, and that is there was a, a bill that was sponsored by Senator Nicole Poor and Representative Val Longhurst mm -hmm. in which now all new teachers, or not all, all teachers, not all new teachers, have to um, receive 90 minutes of suicide prevention training that um, in the Delaware school system and I think that since teen suicides and you know are a big issue in Delaware that's something that a lot of people probably don't know but are going to be very thankful for. Yeah I was at that announcement especially suicide is, is definitely a problem in Sussex County it seems that's yes. why we had uh, some people come out and study. Uh, anything uh, else on, on your minds this, uh, this state of play? Do you think anything will possibly change drastically when it comes to the budget. I haven't seen the political will yet to really squarely look the budget issue in the face. Everything has to be done on June 30th, so as we like to say, stay tuned. Stephanie Hansen and Michael Stafford, uh, thanks as well for just being here as always. American Pharaoh's win at the Belmont Stakes brings to an end a nearly 40-year drought for a Triple Crown winner. Horse racing does have a grace and beauty to it, and that's where we turn to bear artist Sean Faust. His paintings have a life of their own down to the tiniest detail. Our first experience shows you how it all starts with the eyes. My name is Sean Faust. I've been painting for about 25 years. When I was a kid, I always wanted to do portraits. I mean, I was the kid that was in the comics, and I was fascinated with the human form. So I was always the kid with the, the pen and ink or the pencil, and I would just, you know, grab as many comics as I would, look at the, uh, the line work, and make my own characters, you know, with the muscles and the, and the dynamic forms. First reason I even wanted to go paint a horse. It's just the first time I ever laid eyes on a horse. Um, I was mesmerized. And it's something about the horse. When you stand next to the first horse as a kid, it probably could have been a little pony, but I was just in awe. I mean, it's, this is something that you could actually walk up to and touch. And quite frankly, it's that, that's not in a zoo that won't eat you. In fact, when I recently painted a, a Clydesdale, you know, standing next to that enormous horse. It took me right back, all my senses, to that, that first day when I was a kid again. In 1995, I studied with Daniel Green in New York. I remember the last day of class, 
he emphasized, it's, it's all about the eyes. Go find a cow or a horse and paint their eyes. And immediately, I said to myself, horses. I mean, I was the kid that wanted a pony, you know, and I loved horses. It kind of you know, took off from there. When people see my work and they say, oh, it looks so real, that's a good thing. God created this world so beautiful. I really don't want to mess it up. Many times I feel as though I'm a conductor and I have an orchestra of pastel, pencil, canvas. How do I get this orchestra to play for me to get my vision on canvas? There's no greater feeling than, than to, uh, to see a painting complete to the point I can sign it and I'm happy with it and then to, to get that reaction. I, it's just, you know, in my heart I'm a millionaire. You know, you can be a starving artist, but inside there's so much value. I do paint to live, but I live to paint and that's it's, it's the only thing I ever wanted to do. It's the only thing that I'm going to do. It's successful to me when I step back and, and I get that light on it. I get that same beauty or that shine on the muscle. And that's it. I'm, I'm thrilled that I can capture that. And, and even more thrilled when people get it. I'm so blessed to be able to do what I love to do. One side note, Sean, his son, and father were at Belmont last weekend. There were two paintings Sean was working on in our story. Here's the finished product. Youngin is the first one, and here is all ears. For more information on Sean, his art, and upcoming shows, you can find him on the web. Go to SeanFaust.com to learn more. Next week on First, we're going to report on a story we were going to present last week. Lawn waste can affect the quality of our water. We'll report on efforts to change that. Look for those stories and more on the next First. That is First for this week. We thank you so much for watching. We thank Karen Smiles for sitting in. Mark will be back next week. I'm Michelle Polston. Have a great week.